Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Carol Rogan, and I'm the Scientific Project Manager for Dementia Research Network Ireland. And um, we're delighted to be collaborating with the National Dementia Office uh, this afternoon on this post-diagnostic support forum. And thanks to Emer Begley in particular in the National Dementia Office for helping put together this program. And um, thanks as well to Fiona Kyo from the Centre for Economic and Social Research on Dementia in NUI Galway, who also uh, provided input to the program. Um, and I'd also like to thank Engaging Dementia for inviting us to be the wrap-up event for uh, what sounds like was a very successful two-day conference that they ran uh, for the last two days. So, so we're delighted to be the, the last event um, today. Um, the aim of this forum is to explore the uh, landscape for post-diagnostic supports in Ireland. And we're going to talk about best practice in this area. And then through a panel discussion, which will kick off at three o'clock, um, we we'll look at what are the, the um, enablers and barriers to the implementation of post-diagnostic supports. So hopefully there'll be lots of, lots of interesting discussion there. Um, you'll see that you have um, a chat and Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So we haven't built in a time specifically for a question and answer session, but if you do have any comments or questions as the presenters go through, feel free to, um, to use the, the chat and Q&A uh, buttons and we'll do our best um, to address some of the questions if they do arise. And we have our panel discussion as well, which some of the, the questions might come up in that as well. Um, okay, so what we'll do first is uh, start with a quick poll. Um, so we have Grace there in the background, uh, who's going to um, show us a poll um, for the attendee type. Um, so hopefully we'll see some results in a minute. So uh, when you logged on, um, people were asked to just click which category you're in. So it just gives us an idea of, um, of who we have in the audience. So we have 78 people signed in so far. So that's great. And you're all very welcome. We're great that there's a, a good turnout for this forum. Okay, so I'm not seeing any of the results there yet. So we might just uh, leave that for a few minutes. And um, okay, so it looks like there's no audio connection for Minister Butler. So what we might do is uh, go ahead to our first speaker, um, who's Dr. Emer Begley from the National Dementia Office where uh, she's senior project manager. Um, and she's going to take us through um, an overview of the current post-diagnostic landscape in Ireland. Thanks, Eimear. Thanks so much, uh, Carol, and hello, everyone. Um, it's for, I know it's very challenging with technology to, to do this, so um, thanks, everyone, for bearing with us. And just to thank Carol in particular for putting together the forum. Uh, we were delighted in the National Dementia Office to be invited to partner with Dementia Research Network Ireland on the forum, and Carol has really carried an awful lot of the work around this, so thanks to Carol. So I have been asked to provide an overview of the dementia post-diagnostic landscape in 10 minutes, so I'll do the best I can, but um, it's, a, it's a very changing and changed landscape, but um, I suppose a good starting point is to say that we're not there yet in terms of providing a holistic round of post-diagnostic support for people with dementia, but we're certainly on the right road and there's been a lot of changes over the last number of years. Um, in terms of the policy position, a starting point for us in the National Dementia Office is the National Dementia Strategy. And within the strategy under the priority action area, um, timely diagnosis and intervention, there's a commitment that the HSE will develop a national and local dementia care pathway. So to describe and, and outline the optimal journey from the point that the person has concerns to diagnosis and then into intervention. And under that kind of overall objective, there's two key elements. One is that following a diagnosis, people with dementia, their carers know to, know where to go for help, and that there is a range of flexible community-based supports that are available to them. So for us in the National Dementia Office, it's a really good starting point in terms of thinking about and developing those critical care pathways for and um, I joined the office in 2017, and while the office was established in 2015, it only became fully staffed in 2017 when three of us three of us joined. And 
one of the first things we did in conjunction with the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland was to map dementia-specific services in the community. Um, there's a real you know, deficit in terms of evidence at that time around dementia services, where they were located and what they were doing. So the mapping project was a really good baseline for us. And what it, what it showed wasn't anything, we, I suppose anecdotally, we didn't know, but it gave us the hard evidence around it. And it showed that there were significant gaps in service provision and inconsistency in the availability of service at both the county and CHO level. There was low levels of intervention for people in the earlier stages of dementia, and there was a focus more on things like daycare in the community. And daycare was the main service offered to people in the community, and carer support was followed. There was low levels of dementia inclusive activities as well, where there were centres of activities, but large areas where there was nothing. And the community and voluntary sector were the main provider in the space. And um, and ASI were the main the main provider, um, underpinned by HSE funding in lots of cases, but there was also a fundraising element to that. So that kind of gave us a good picture of where we were at na nationally, and really it, it, it supported that the, the common we held um, opinion that there was a geographical lottery in terms of access to post-diagnostic reports. And on the back of this, then in the NGO, we developed two projects. One was the diagnostic project, and the other was the post-diagnostic project. And I led out on the second one and really it was looking at well, what additional evidence do we need to support the development of care pathways and how and to identify best practice to inform those pathways. And those projects ran from 2017 to 2019. And this year we've developed, we're in the process of developing a dementia model of care. And the model of care follows on from those two initial projects and it's looking specifically at diagnosis, disclosure and post-diagnostic support pathways. And we're undertaking the development of the model in conjunction with the um, DSIDC and with the CS, CESRD in Galway and we have a clinical expert as well. And really importantly, we have an advisory group who's supporting the development of the model and that should be published in 2021. And Fiona Kyo later on this, this afternoon is going to um, talk to you a little bit about what's in the post-diagnostic part of the model or where the thinking is and, and how that's evolving. So the evidence base then that were that informing the model of care, a lot of it came out of the work of the diagnostic and post-diagnostic projects. But uh, you know, we have to, I have to say as well that there's a huge amount happening both nationally and internationally, and a huge amount of evidence that we're drawing on. But I just want to uh, draw your attention to um, key publications from the National Dementia Office. Alongside the mapping project, we also reviewed memory clinics across the country, and we did that with the DSIDC, and that showed us that there was, again, inconsistency of memory assessment services across the country. For instance, the Western Seaboard had no um, specialist memory service, and getting a diagnosis, I suppose, is the first step to getting those critical post-diagnostic supports. Um, so that was a really important piece of work. We also surveyed clinicians to find out where people get a diagnosis. And we looked at, um, we commissioned a study looking at young onset dementia, those under 65s, to see what their pathways were around diagnosis and post-diagnostic support. And we commissioned two literature reviews, one on diagnostic services and one on post-diagnostic supports to kind of look at what is the available best evidence to inform the pathways. And alongside this, we were also looking at the effectiveness of existing services and supports. The National Dementia Strategy had a commitment to evaluate the Dementia Advisor Service, and that was undertaken in 2019. We've also looked at evaluating Understand Together in Communities, the framework that underpins that campaign. The memory technology resource rooms were evaluated. And really importantly, the Dementia Intensive Home Care Packages. Um, that evaluation gave us a huge amount of information about what personalised supports should look like and can look like for people with dementia. Many of these evaluations were also process evaluations, which really supports our thinking about how to roll things out um, beyond where the pilots or the, the testing concept sites were based. So alongside that evidence, then we do have a changing landscape for dementia services in Ireland. And um, in the recent budget announcement that uh, Minister Butler made, um, she announced an increase in the number of dementia advisors. So I've borrowed the little map at the top of your screen from the Alzheimer's Society, and it shows that there are parts of the country in blue that don't currently have a dementia advisor. By the end of the year, we're going to have national coverage for a DA service. And I know Samantha Taylor from the ASI is going to speak later on during the forum, so I won't go into the dementia advisor service in any detail. But that service is going to be further enhanced again in 2021. 
The memory technology resource rooms are another key part of, I suppose, the service infrastructure that can support the delivery of post-diagnostic support. And when we did the mapping project in 2017, there were four memory technology resource rooms. Now there's 27, and there's one in every county in the country. Now, some staff had had to be redeployed for COVID, but there is a national helpline that people can call to access the MTR service. And each of the MTRs has an occupational therapist who's connected to it, um, undertakes an OT assessment with the person, gives advice and support on assistive tech, but also really importantly, can signpost them to other services and can refer them, refer them on. So that is, I suppose, in a developing service, it was a, the, the network was uh, formally launched in 2018. So it's very, it's still very new. Um, alongside that, then we also have the Irish Dementia Cafe Network. Um, there's 21 dementia cafes across the country and uh, we commissioned Engaging Dementia to develop the network and I know Sinead Grennan is going to speak to that later on as well so I won't go into much detail about that but dementia cafes are really critical in terms of information provision but also very importantly peer support for people with dementia as well. Um, and I suppose there's lots of programs and interventions, psychosocial programs, um, psychoeducation programs, cognitive therapies that are being delivered in different sites across the country. And what really struck me um, during the Engaging Dementia conference was the amount of these programs and interventions that are no longer pilots or testing concept, but are really integrated into existing service and are seen as crucial in terms of supporting people with dementia. And that is a relatively, that's a relatively new thing. We also have a national health reform agenda and Solange Care, we're going to see a change in how services are delivered with the move into the community. And we have a very vibrant community and voluntary sector who are providing a lot of those community-based post-diagnostic supports. And underpinning a lot of this, and it's a real enabler, is the Understand Together in Communities campaign. And that's raising awareness of dementia um, and increasing understandings of it. And in recent years, we've seen a move into understand together in communities. And Fiona Foley is the national coordinator there, and she kindly lent me some of her slides. But that this campaign is really about creating dementia inclusive communities where people feel respected, supported, and connected. Fiona is working with over 40 national partner organizations who are trying to make their services and organizations more dementia inclusive. And there's 340 community champions working across the country. Again, many of those are working within health and social care, but see the need to have community responses or inclusive communities that can enhance their work, but also and also support the person to live well at home. Um, there's a range of resources available as well, just to flag those. There's understandtogether.ie, it's a, a public facing website, one stop shop around dementia, and there's a service finder there where you can look to get um, information on the dementia specific services by county and those that are based in your community. And Dementia Pathways is a um, website for health and social care professionals that has a range of resources for um, to support practice. There's also dementia training and education programs as well. So that is a very quick whistle stop tour of the current landscape around dementia post-diagnostic supports in Ireland. I think it's really important to say that it is a changing and change landscape from a number of years ago, but we're certainly not there yet. And I think um, collaborative and collective working is kind of a key step to, to how we can get there. And I'm going to be back for the discussion later if anybody has any questions, but I'll hand you back to, to Carol now. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Ingrid. That was a really um, interesting overview there of, of the post-diagnostic support landscape in Ireland. Um, so we now have our technical glitch sorted out and uh, apologies for that. So I'll now hand you over to Minister Mary Buckler, Minister of State at the Department of Health with responsibility for mental health and older people. Uh, thank you very much, Carl. And firstly, can I apologise for um, being a few minutes late? Uh, the gremlins got into one computer, so we had to set up another device. So delighted to be here today. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to join you. I am sorry that we cannot meet in person, but at least modern technology allows us to meet remotely. I would like to commend the National Dementia Office and the Dementia Research Network Ireland for organising today's forum. I believe it promises to be an interesting afternoon to discuss on what our post-diagnostic services look like today and what they should aim to achieve in the future. As you may know, I am passionate about supporting people with dementia and their families. I was co-chair of the All-Party Oireachtas Committee on Dementia in the Last All with Senator Colette Kelleher. And I suppose we 
had a really good committee where we left the politics at the door. We came in, we sat down and we knocked heads together. So we worked to ensure dementia was well placed in the political consciousness and highlighted the needs of people with dementia with colleagues in the Oireachtas. And, you know, I am delighted to say I did, I did play a key role in making sure in the program for government that dementia was front and centre. One of my first jobs as Minister of State with responsibility for older people was to secure a comprehensive package of supports for older people, including the area of budget, the area of dementia in budget 2021. As you all know, look, we have 64,000 people living in Ireland with dementia. And this figure is expected to increase to 150,000 by 2045. So we have a duty to ensure that post-diagnostic supports are in place at an early stage so that people with dementia can continue living well in their communities. And it's so important for the 11 people every day that are diagnosed with dementia that we are able to offer the supports they need, the correct wraparound supports. I suppose it's the whole premise of Slaunch Care, it's the whole premise of supporting people to live well in their communities. And that's why, you know, post-diagnostic supports are hugely, hugely important. There is growing evidence about the value of early intervention for the well-being of people with dementia and their relatives and their carers. Early intervention can help enhance dementia symptom management and prevent behavioural change. Post-diagnostic support can lead to enhanced social contact, helping to reduce isolation for people with dementia and family carers. It can also allow people to come to terms with the diagnosis which is hugely important for many, many families, understanding the diagnosis, the, the diagnosis and learning to live with it. As Minister of State, I know that there's still much work to be done to enhance services and supports for people living with dementia and those who care for them. More than ever, we need to support these people, as I have said, living at home. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has hampered the provision of community supports across the country. And I suppose from my own point of view, I've been inundated with groups that, you know, organisations that run daycare centres, active retirement groups, the Dacia Dementia, uh, sorry, the, the Dementia Cafes. I, I just mentioned the Dacia one there because I'm very familiar with it. And I suppose this has been a hugely, hugely challenging time for people. But the HSE and voluntary service providers have continued to work to ensure some continuity of service. The HSE has adapted its community services in order to provide a flexible response so that the needs of people with dementia continue to be met during the COVID-19 crisis. Primary care, care team support is operating nationwide with referrals being made to community supports, including the Dementia Advisor Service and the local authority community response forums. The fact that we are now living with COVID-19 creates new challenges in ensuring that there is access to the right services and supports to assist people to live well in their communities, but it also creates opportunities to provide services in new ways. Budget 2021 brought a renewed focus on the need of people living with dementia with some 12.9 million funding for new measures next year. This is a significant achievement in providing for the development of a range of services and supports for people with dementia and their families. The additional funding will support the recruitment of a further 11 dementia advisors in 2021, which will provide a locally based and individualized information, signposting, emotional support service in every county. And I heard Ema refer earlier to the mapping exercise that was done in 2017. And it was one thing that really struck me about the postcode lottery of supports that were available throughout the country. And this is one area that I'm really, really strong on. I believe everybody should be able to access the support they need in their own community. These additional posts, including a national coordinator, will increase the dementia advisor team to 30 by the end of 2021. And I think it's important to remember that when we were going into last year's budget, we only had eight dementia advisors in the, in the country. And we finally made the breakthrough of, of getting um, another eight. So to be able to say that by the end of 2021, we will have 30 plus um, a coordinator should hugely make, should make a huge difference to people. And there will be greater equ equity of access um, for people who, who need the service. As part of the programme for government's commitment to increase home supports, Budget 2021 provides for a minimum of 250,000 additional home support hours to be allocated to people with dementia, ensuring that more people with dementia can continue to live at home with the appropriate supports. 
The provision of the 12.9 million euro for new measures next year also includes 5 million in funding to significantly expand community-based dementia supports across the country in line with the National Dementia Strategy and the recommendations of the 2018 mapping exercise conducted by the HSE and the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. I am particularly pleased that the additional funding in budget 2021 will enable us to improve access around the country. As we all know, a timely diagnosis of dementia is an important step in receiving the tailored support and treatment that enables people to live full lives and remain engaged with their families and communities for as long as possible. Early diagnosis gives the best opportunity to plan for the future. The additional funding will help the HSE to establish a specialist memory clinic in Cork and four regional memory assessment and support service in, the, in Mayo and Sligo and then in Wexford and Waterford in the southeast. We also plan to improve the national network of memory technology resource rooms, which will link into the new diagnostic service. The additional funding will also increase access to in-home daycare, which will benefit those who cannot access daycare outside the home due to COVID-19 and the public health restrictions. This is consistent with the vision of Slauncha Care to ensure people receive the right support in the right place and at the right time. We are committed to building on the success of Dementia Understand Together campaign and have secured funding to grow this important social movement in 2021 and the coming years. And as I said last week when I met um, the team from the National Dementia Office, I think it has been one of the most um, successful campaigns that were ever run, um, Understanding Together. I believe it brings dementia into the home. When you're sitting down and you're watching television and you see that particular ad, you can relate to somebody in your community. And I think it has done a fantastic job for reducing the stigma um, associated with dementia. Conscious of the need to improve care pathways and the experience and outcomes of people with dementia in acute care settings, funding secured in the budget will enable us to help to deliver an acute hospital dementia and delirium care pathway and provide the training needs to ensure the effective implementation of the National Clinical Guideline on the appropriate use of psychotropic medication in people with dementia launched in December 2019. These measures are wide ranging, they're, they're ambitious, but they will offer a greater level of support to our family members, our neighbours and friends with dementia, their families and their carers. The government is committed to building on this progress and moving forward with the implementation of the National Dementia Strategy. As a long time advocate for people with dementia, I will ensure that dementia remains a key focus for government in the coming years. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the hard work of the National Dementia Office, its partners, and the many other stakeholders who work tirelessly to improve services and supports for people with dementia and their families. Gaurav Mahagut. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Butler, for taking time out of your very busy schedule. So I really appreciate you uh, talking to us today. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so what we might do next is show the poll um, for the attendees that we have today. Um, so if, uh, if you have that handy, Grace, before we go to our next uh, speaker. So uh, there we have um, an interesting uh, mix of people, obviously very strong on health and social care professionals, um, but a nice mix of, of other people as well. Um, okay, that's great. Thanks for doing that. Um, so I'll hand you over now to our next speaker, Professor Siobhan Riley, who's Director of the Centre for Applied Dementia Studies in the University of Bradford in the UK. And Siobhan's going to be talking about what does the evidence tell us in relation to what matters most to people living with dementia? All right, thank you for, for the introduction, Carol. I'm just gonna swap my screens around because I've got two screens here. Okay, so, um, okay, so I'm delighted to get the opportunity to present our core outcome set for use when evaluating non-pharmacological health and social care interventions for people living with dementia at home. So I led this study from my previous position at Lancaster University. The study was funded by the ESRC and the NIHR as part of the Neighbourhoods and Dementia Study, which was a, pro, a research programme which, which was led by Professor John Keady from the University of Manchester. So thanks to all the research team from the Universities of Lancaster, Manchester and Liverpool who've contributed to this study and a big thanks to the lead researcher Andy Harding. So in this presentation I'm going to cover three main 
um, main aspects, the importance of outcomes when measuring effectiveness of services. And I'll tell you about our recent research exploring outcomes that matter to people living with dementia. And then I'll talk through some implications for assessing the effectiveness of post-diagnostic support. So there's growing evidence in demonstrating effectiveness of our care and services, including post-diagnostic support. However, measuring effectiveness is fraught with challenges, not least because people living with dementia have not had a voice in this process. There have been some consensus exercises conducted in this area already. However, the involvement of people living with dementia has tended to be either non-existent or tokenistic. And there's also been a lot of inconsistency in the outcome measurement instruments that researchers use, making it difficult to compare across studies. So there's a strong argument for researchers to agree on a minimum use of outcome measures and avoid inconsistency in the choice of measures. So one of the solutions is to undertake the development of a core outcome set. And the aim of these are to attain consensus from key stakeholders on what are the most important outcomes. And the output is a recommendation of the minimum set of outcomes that should be measured and how to measure them across all trials within the scope of the core outcome set. So this is what we set out to do five or six years ago. And um, in our core outcome set study, we started right at the beginning and shelved all existing assumptions about outcomes and how to measure them. We had two main research questions in relation to non-pharmacological community-based interventions for people living with dementia at home. The first one was which outcomes should be measured from the perspective of people living with dementia, care partners, health and social care professionals, policy makers, commissioners, and research leaders. And um, the second one was, how should these outcomes be measured? So I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail about um, the research methods, but suffice to say that we, we used a three, a three phase mixed method study design conducting 35 interviews and four focus groups with 55 people. And we conducted a, a literature review in phase one. We identified 170 possible outcomes in phase one, and then we had to go through a process of whittling this down into a manageable number, and then getting these outcomes into a suitable format so people could answer questions on them in our phase two which consisted of a Delphi survey and a consensus meeting. And then in phase three, we conducted a systematic review to identify how the outcomes identified should be measured. We made sure we had co-research involvement embedded throughout the study. For example, we had people living with dementia um, who are part of our advisory group and they helped design access an accessible Delphi survey and provided feedback and input on existing outcome measurement instruments in phase three. When we've presented this previously at conferences and events, we've co-presented with Pam, a person living with dementia, and Rita, a carer, who were both involved as co-researchers in the study. So in phase one and two, we included 62 instances of people living with dementia being involved. 17 were participants in phase one and 18 were consulted as co-researchers when des designing the accessible de um, Delphi process. And 21 participated in the Delphi survey and six in the consensus meeting. I need to note that the majority of our data for phase one was collected in England. So for phase two, um, the 54 outcomes that we extracted from the literature and identified through the qualitative research um, with key stakeholders made up um, the Delphi survey. And this was sent to over 300 people from key stakeholder groups mentioned earlier. And then again, about a month or two later, this Delphi survey um, was sent again. And in this, they people had to rate the importance of each item. 
So then we held a consensus workshop and you can see pictures here of that to attain our agreement on the, on the core outcomes. And our final set had 13 core outcomes. So we enlisted the support of Tony Husband, the renowned cartoonist, and he's the gentleman on the bottom photograph at the back row. And um, he very, um, he attended the, the consensus meeting and very unobtrusively sat alongside the discussions, capturing these in his cartoons. These had the dual purpose of being a very visual record at the time of the event, um, but also adding some fun and humor. And we hoped that the cartoons would be useful in engaging the public to our work. So here are the 13 core outcome items which matter most to people living with dementia. So many of these 13 outcome items, which hopefully you can see um, clearly on the screen, um, have a substantive overlap with the emergent concept of social health, which is a shift in focus from the symptoms, deficit and disability towards the capacity and potential of the person with dementia. So some of these outcomes we didn't find represented in the trials that we looked at in the literature review. For example, feeling safe and secure and the importance of relationships and feeling valued and respected by others and having a laugh. So we published our, all our work in open access journals and I'll show a publication list at the end. And in the longer term, we hope that the use of the final core outcome set will, um, will reduce inconsistency in reporting outcome data trialists, researchers and commissioners will then be able to compare effectiveness across non-pharmacological community-based health and social care interventions for people living at home. So in the final phase of our research, we conducted a systematic literature review and we identified outcome measurement instruments that had previously been used in dementia care research. And um, and we wanted to determine how or even if the 13 outcome items can be measured. I'm not gonna go into all the detail here, but suffice to say that after a lot of work, we were not impressed on the measurement instruments being able to measure all of the 13 items. So it was interesting to learn that the researchers in the evaluation of HSE's National Dementia Post-Diagnostic Support Grant Scheme decided not to use the standardized um, measures measuring cognitive function and quality of life or behavior. Instead, they developed a short evaluation form for completion at the end of the intervention. And the form focused on well-being and emerging outcomes. And there's certainly some overlap with our 13 items. So how is this relevant for post-diagnostic support? So it'll be obvious to most of you that many people with dementia find it difficult coming to terms with the diagnosis. And what should underpin post-diagnostic support, um, post-diagnostic services is a person-centered approach and continuous quality assurance, evidence gathering and a commitment to exploring and acting on a person's experience of service and a commitment to co-designing solutions to challenges identified. And if you're in the, in, the, um, in the position of delivering an intervention, you might notice the qualitative differences in people who receive or attend the interventions and how they feel afterwards. And it's important to have some ongoing evaluation in the form of service user feedback which could be along the lines of checking how services affect the 13 domains important to people. I'm gonna highlight a few of the 13 outcome items as examples of how they fit with post-diagnostic support. And I'll use the cartoons by Tony Husband. So continuing good relationships was rated as one of the most important items. 
Having a diagnosis of dementia means that decisions about who to tell, when and how are likely to be made. And it's important that friends and family understand the changes. It's clearly a family affair. So the education element of many of the post-diagnostic support intervention, interventions is hugely important in supporting those relationships. So being able to have, um, sorry, being able to communicate with others and feeling connected with others is highly valued in everyday lives. People living with dementia often feel alone and isolated. They may have lost old friends, but when they are able to join a group such as a dementia cafe or a cognitive stimulation group, they benefit from the chatter, sharing of experience and enjoyment, and they manage to get their, how their voices heard in a safe environment. Indeed, the opportunity for social action and interaction and the chance to talk and being able to have a laugh with other people is often a benefit from these groups, not necessarily the aim, but a good outcome from getting the atmosphere right. So being able to do the things you enjoy and want to keep doing. So the sense of loss that people may feel after getting a diagnosis means that people need support to be able to do the things they enjoy and want to keep doing. In the journeying through dementia research study led by Professor Gail Mountain, is a 12 week program supporting people in the early stages of dementia to continue living healthy, fulfilling lives. The Journeying Through Dementia program um, involved people attending the program. Um, they, could have, they could attend with their supporter, usually a family member or friend, or if they liked, they didn't have to. The links provided on this slide, which I'm sure will be shared afterwards, um, will take you to some lovely films about the intervention. So um, we have used in, in our um, I'm Me cartoon um, on a number of study materials, um, infographics and postcards. So if you're interested in these, do get in touch with me if you think you can use them. So the cartoon was one of the many cartoons drawn by Tony Husband during the consensus meeting. And it was selected by our co-researchers as the cartoon that most fully captured the essence of the final co core outcome set. So we believe that focusing on, on these 13 core outcome areas and measuring them consistently, consistently will increase the quality of evidence and be responsive to what people living with dementia value. As I noted earlier, most of our data was collected in England. So it may not map exactly onto the situation in Ireland. Maybe a similar process could be used to identify and find ways to measure outcomes of greatest importance to people living in dementia in Ireland. As a researcher, I want to ensure that interventions, including post-diagnostic support, are evaluated robustly and rigorously so that policymakers, those making decisions about services to fund or how they should be configured, have the best evidence to make those decisions. And in these evaluations, it's important that we ensure that people living with dementia have their voices heard. What matters most to them is really what ought to be measured. And then we can truly influence policymakers and ultimately influence what gets provided for people living with dementia and those who support them. So just um, some acknowledgements. Um, firstly, these, these are the references to the study which you can access at, um, through the links. And thank you to our co-researchers. Thanks to all the study team. And um, finally, I thought you might be interested to know that the University of Bradford has a postgraduate certificate for practitioners with a special interest in dementia. And given the focus on post-diagnostic support as, it, as it's um, being a central part of the dementia care pathway, it's good to highlight. So thank you so much for listening and please do get in touch if you want to know more. Okay, thanks very much, Sean, for a very interesting um, talk there. And certainly it'd be interesting to see that research uh, replicated in Ireland. Um, so I'll hand you over now to our next speaker, who's Dr. Fiona Kyo, a senior research 
social research on dementia in NUI Galway. And Fiona's going to talk about what should the post-diagnostic support pathway look like. Thanks very much, Carol. And uh, I'm delighted uh, that the um, Policy and Practice Forum has, has you know, come to fruition. Uh, it's a great lineup and I'm delighted to be part of it. I'm just going to share my screen uh, so that people can see the slides. Um, yeah. OK, so I'm going to um, follow on really from um, some of the work and, and describe in a bit more detail some of the work that Emer Begley was describing earlier. Uh, but I'm also really reassured to see the fit, um, and I hope you'll see it as it comes up with the work that uh, Siobhan has been doing in Bradford. Um, uh, there's a, I think there's a very good fit between the areas that have people with dementia have identified as being important to them in terms of outcomes and what we're, the way we're structuring the, the post-diagnostic support pathway. Um, so this work um, is commissioned and led by the National Dementia Office, as Emer has outlined. And I want to acknowledge the project team that I'm working alongside. Um, we're each working on different sections of the overall dementia model of care. Uh, the advisory group, uh, which um, is providing us with very uh, helpful guidance um, and also the, the wider post-diagnostic support group and the consultation group that were put together as part of, of the work. There is a, a kind of a health warning attached to this work. Um, as Ema said, the model of care is still very much under development. So we're still actively drafting this and actively working on it. So what you see today is that it is a draft and um, it may change uh, slightly, the content may change, but I think the overall thinking uh, is what I want to share with you today. Um, so one of the very important elements of the overall model of care are the supporting principles um, and I think Siobhan referenced the importance of um, the way in which post-diagnostic supports are delivered um, and that they should be per very person-centred and you can see throughout this these principles that emphasis on citizenship, that people with de dementia have the same access to what they need as other citizens, that they're involved in decision making, that there is very much a person centered approach um, and so uh, as well as treating people and valuing people with dignity and respect uh, people are actually actively involved in their own decisions and um, that the dementia care that they experience is coordinated and integrated and they ex experience it as being integrated um, that is that it's outcome focused it's delivering and um, the outcomes for desired outcomes for the person and I think the um, work that Siobhan and her team have done there would be very helpful in that regard and that it's timely that people get the right support in the right place at the right time and these principles and um, you know you can often see them at the beginning of a document and they often just stay there and we kind of skip the page and uh, we're you know what we're doing with these is actually building them into the description of the delivery of post-diagnostic support so we really want these to inform the delivery of post-diagnostic and um, support and care and and um, through different methods reviewing evidence um and also from, again, early consultation work that was done uh, with people with dementia and carers as part of the overall program of work that Emer described. Uh, we've pulled that together and identified what we're calling strands, five strands of post-diagnostic support. And I think what's really interesting is the way these strands map very well onto some of the outcome areas that Siobhan described. So the strands of post-diagnostic support are understanding and planning, staying connected, staying healthy, supporting cognition and supporting emotional well-being. Um, and there are obviously a number of, of supports under these headings. In terms of um, some examples then under those headings, so under understanding and planning, uh, it's about providing information, peer support groups, signposting, personalised profiles, carer training, advanced care, care, care planning and more. Um, examples of, of support to stay connected are things like dementia cafes, community-based activities, assistive technologies, life story work, and so on. Under staying healthy, we're looking at interventions around health promotion and um, meaningful activities, self-management interventions. So, so Gail's um, journey through dementia care is very much a kind of a self-management intervention, exercise, telecare, and the range of cognitive therapies under supporting cognition 
and then a range of approaches to support emotional well-being, such as sensory approaches, creative arts therapies, counselling, behaviour support interventions, and so on. Um, and these cut right across um, the, the kind of the care uh, pathway, if you like. And my very, uh, you have to forgive my very poor attempt at this, my, my computer graphics aren't great. What I want to try and convey here is that these five strands of support run right the way through um, from the very early uh, symptoms from being diagnosed right through to end of life. So at all stages, while people's needs for these will vary, uh, people will need information, they'll need support around under, understanding and planning throughout the dementia continuum. Um, they will uh, be supported to stay connected, to stay healthy. Uh, their cognition will be supported and emotional well-being. So the idea is that different supports will become prominent at different times as people's needs change over time. And the, um, the model of care, the dementia model of care also very much on the pathway, very much includes um, people with young onset dementia and people with intellectual disability and dementia. So all of these strands and the supports underneath those strands are relevant across the trajectory and for all of these uh, different groups of people. Um, in thinking about um, prescribing or delivering post-diagnostic support, uh, one of the areas that we're focusing on is really trying to be as encourage people to be as specific as possible and to think as carefully as possible about what type of support will work best um, at what point in time. And there are four things or dimensions uh, to think about um, the target recipients, the modality, the setting and the level or intensity. And I'm going to describe these very briefly. So in thinking who so the target, who is it for? Um, so many post-diagnostic supports are designed for more than one target beneficiary. Um, and some are designed just for the person with dementia. So for example, um, cognitive stimulation therapy is just for the person with dementia. Some are for the carer only. So a carer training program is just for the carer. Uh, some interventions and supports are for the dyad. So an Alzheimer dementia cafe is for supporting the dyad. Things like psychoeducation interventions are often designed for a dyad. And then others are for the wider family group. So maybe staying involved in meaningful activities and, and forms of, of psychoeducation and so on. So um, we need to think carefully uh, rather than jumping into, oh, we, you know, this is the best support to think, well, who, you know, who, who, who has the need and what is that need at this time? And then we need to think about how best to provide that support. And there are probably, again, sort of two dimensions here. One is whether it's a group intervention or a one-to-one -one intervention. And some, again, are specifically um, de designed as one-to-one -one interventions. Um, so something like developing a personalized profile is really a one-to-one -one intervention. Um, and others are group interventions. The um, and, and some then are adapted. So, for example, cognitive rehabilitation therapy is, you know, designed as a one-to-one -one intervention, but has been adapted to run as a group intervention. And of course, there are benefits to having a group so that the peer support that comes from a group is an added advantage, if you like, of a group intervention. But it really does depend on what the person wants, what their preferences are, and um, as to, you know, what's the most appropriate we also need to think about uh, being able to deliver something online now as a virtual intervention um, as opposed to uh, being in person. And again, clarity on that modality really helps to tailor the support uh, to the person's needs. In terms of the setting, um, where to, to provide that support, obviously there are a wide variety of settings uh, from the person or the carer's own home, and uh, maybe day centers, memory technology resource rooms, I think are becoming an increasingly important resource. And Emer described the availability of those now around the country or dementia hubs and um, residential settings, because obviously people, that whole continuum uh, we're considering in this pathway. Um, maybe specific health settings, so um, on, on a campus, maybe a room in a, in a community hospital. Um, Non-health or social settings are very important, so from men's sheds to family resource centres, maybe um, a hotel room for a dementia cafe, for example, and, and others. Uh, again, what's going to suit best for this person and carer and, and so on at that, at that point in time. And then to think about what level of support. Um, and this is this concept of stepped care. 
Um, and it moves from, you know, from kind of tier one where we're talking about self-management, support from family, friends and peers, support from community and voluntary organisations through to more formal or structured support um, from community and voluntary organisations and maybe specific interventions from health and social care professionals and on then through to more specialised interventions. So again, um, our thinking is very much that everybody should be accessing um, tier one support um, at, at some point because that is the, the staying connected, the um, you know, the supporting emotional well-being, and then the more specialist um, supports as people needs as people's needs change um, over time. Just to finish, then to give you some sense of what this pathway will look like. So there are, you know, for the not just the post-diagnostic pathway, but the whole dementia model of care. So it starts with assessment and diagnosis, through disclosure, uh, the development of a support and treatment plan. Um, and then under post-diagnostic support, uh, you know, we're thinking that we will have a core offering. Uh, so everybody who has who is diagnosed uh, will, will get this core offering of initial post-diagnostic support. And that is information, a named point of contact, and then onward referral um, as their needs arise um, to, and you can see it there with the, 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 the video bar, but other, um, other post-diagnostic supports based on the person's needs and circumstances um, coming from that menu of support that I've just described. So that's a, again a whistle-stop tour of the thinking um, behind the um, development of the post-diagnostic uh, pathway and the overall dementia model of care. And again I'm, I'm happy to take questions um, after. Thank you. Okay that's great, thanks very much Fiona. Um, so now we're going to move on to the next session of the forum and so we're going to have three uh, brief um, talks on examples of post-diagnostic support. So one, cognitive stimulation therapy, second one, dementia cafes, and the third one being the Dementia Advisory Service run by the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. Um, so for the first talk, um, we're joined by Colin Doody, who's an assistant psychologist and has been co-facilitating um, CST sessions in St. Brendan's Community Nursing Unit in Ballinasloe. So I'll hand over to you, Colin. Hi, Kyle, can you hear me? Yep, can hear you. Perfect, yep. yeah. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to present today. And uh, my colleague, uh, Sinead Grennan, is also on the line, I understand. Um, and uh, the pair of us have ever uh, had a good time pre preparing this presentation. So I'm going to be talking to you today about um, our adaptation of a cognitive stimulation or specifically a maintenance cognitive stimulation therapy program with older adults with dementia in Ballinasloe, County Galway to a uh, kind of a, 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 a CST inspired one-to-one -one phone service uh, over the lockdown one, if you like. So very, very briefly, actually I'll be a short presentation. What is cognitive stimulation therapy? An evidence-based group intervention with people from mild to moderate uh, dementia. Uh, CST itself, the base version is uh, short, it's only seven weeks. Uh, so we had run a number of those in Ballina Slow and the graduates uh, from this program uh, made up our core uh, MCST cohort. Uh, so the MCST program we had in Balanced Low uh, was uh, run for 26 weeks. It, shopped, it stopped about four weeks uh, early, just at the start of March. Uh, so we were well advanced through the program at that stage. So what, was, what did our group look like? So uh, as I said, it ran weekly for an hour. Um, in uh, the St. Brendan's uh, CNU Ballina Slow. And we had uh, roughly between 10 to 15 participants every week. So a relatively good turnout. And the group was structured in ter terms of teams. So each week had a different team. This could range from reminiscence one week to household tips on another. And this was kind of, we did our best to tailor that to the abilities of our cohort, uh, who are generally, I think Sinead will agree, and the, the question answered afterwards were, were uh, very well able to go. Uh, and each module was a team, as I said, money, uh, various different ones. And the participation is uh, encouraged rather than achievement. Um, so we did have a range of abilities and it was nice, we really fostered this sense of, uh, it wasn't about the right answer, it was about the effort and the enjoyment. So uh, it was a privilege to, to work on the programme from that point of view. So very brief examples, session activities. So top left there be famous people who are they 
rate them on controversially we had rate them from the most attractive to the least attractive who was the best singer who's the worst singer so uh created some really lively debates um uh uh in in the sessions things into using old money all feeling into kind of the uh, re reminiscence themes so the benefits of cst and mcst are uh well established cst has uh, been shown to be as effective in medication in some circumstances uh, through a Cochrane review. Uh, carers reported that they experienced their loved ones as sharper after the group and cognitive uh, functioning is improved and maintained and quality of life improvement uh, specter et al. So it's a good research foundation as well as anecdotal evidence from our own group. Uh, the research was there to support it. So this was then into the nitty gritty, uh, the impact specifically on our service. So March 2020, like all programs nationally and internationally, saw a cessation of the programs in March. So we were coming to the end of uh, the program. We were at 22 weeks or so out of the, the 26. Um, so we decided uh, we had the resources. Myself and Sinead had um, we had a good bit left in our contracts. So we were there anyway, so we, we, we felt that it'd be great to offer some sort of continuity of service. So we decided that we'd adapt the principles M MCST to a phone-based service. So we identified three separate work streams that we need to do. So we designed and developed and adapted a CST framework for phone calls. We delivered the service. And then finally, we evaluated the service. And we actually published a, an, an article with DRNI, Grenan et al, if people, et al, if people are interested. So the steps in adapting the, the program to the phone-based intervention. So the calls were structured similarly to uh, the actual group sessions. So we had a team every week. It might be current affairs, um, could be reminiscence, could be, again, those household tips. It was different every week. So at the start, we front-loaded the works. So we sent out hard copy resources uh, to ease the participants in the transition. So to kind of acclimatize them to what was going to happen and to give them some tangible hard copy uh, materials to work from. So uh, the facilitators, so myself and Sinead, we completed a psychological first aid training just so that we would be prepared ourselves to deal with um, just in case any sort of those issues arose. So just to have protection for ourselves and also more importantly for the client. So the calls vary depending on the client. Some of them were as short as five minutes. Some of them uh, could, could, could go on as long as half an hour, just depending on the day and, and what the client felt they were able for or was open to. Um, so nice variety there. And we developed again, like a specific safety protocol. So our supervisor, uh, Dr. Diana Mahoney, uh, senior clinical psychologist, she supervised uh, all of this work and we reported directly to her and there was that constant supervision. So uh, tried to follow a best practice model. So the actual delivery itself. So as I said, it's the one week, for, uh, the once a week phone call. Uh, we planned out our structures each week. So trying to keep that intervention fidelity so that each person is roughly receiving the same uh, standard of intervention. So we, whilst we didn't script, um, we did have a kind of a set plan that we'd carry out every week. Um, if appropriate and in certain circumstances, uh, the next of kin of the client was also, um, was also, we kind of engage with them, see how was the client doing, um, were there any extra, extra supports needed? So this, you know, could be as simple as sending out extra word searches or something like that. So it was nice to have that contact. And there was, uh, we were very pleased to say there was no break in the service delivery. Um, so the calls were made in the first week that the first face-to-face -face MCST couldn't take place and um, ended in early September. So then evaluating the science, uh, the service, the client experience, I'm just conscious at the time, so quickly go through these. So universally, it was rated really, really highly uh, by the clients. So we did our own internal service review just to see kind of halfway through the sessions or the, the, the weeks or the between March and September. So we just had a quick, um, our own service evaluation to see, you know, was there anything we can improve on? And the feedback from the clients was very, very good. Very, very good feedback from the carers and the next of kin who felt one, yes, we were supporting uh, the, their family member, but also that they had a kind of an access or direct link with the MDT team. So that was very positive. And all clients expressed a wish that the phone calls would continue. Uh, indefinitely. So our own reflections then. Uh, so what facilitated uh, the effectiveness of, of this program, I suppose, was that we had the pre-existing relationship between the facilitators and the clients. Um, so we had this rapport built up. We felt that it'd be quite difficult if you got a brand new client group 
and try to run a CSD program over the phone, that that would be quite difficult. And even just the relationships with CARES as well, that, you know, we had built up a relationship with CARES. So there was that external support network that if we were dealing with a client or we needed something to be sent out, that we could pick up the phone. We had that, that good contact. And uh, as well, the clients had, the, they, they were very familiar with the session layout. They knew that, first of all, we'd be doing a kind of the current affairs. We'd be moving to uh, the theme of the day. So the clients were, they were very well up in the program. They knew, uh, they, they knew the score. So valuing the service, the challenges. So four key, key challenges uh, that we came across. So there was the fact it was on the phone is there was a reliance on a single sensory input. So when you're in the sessions in, in, when we were in, in person, you know, there's sight, sound, uh, touch, taste, smell with the phone call, it was just sound. So that created its own problems specifically um, if somebody had a hearing impairment that was really exacerbated. Again, we didn't have the same amount of resources um, over the phone. We relied on stuff that we could send out periodically. We couldn't produce stuff in session. And um, the fact, again, that it was over the phone and there wasn't like in that, there wasn't the, the in, there was no group dynamics, unfortunately, over the phone. So again, it was more limited. So very quickly, then the MDT perspective, they, the MDT team rated the intervention very, very highly. And they felt that it provided a good social out, outlet for our clients. And they felt that overall referrals for anxiety specifically were a lot less than they had predicted um, while the service was being running. So very positive outcome from that. And finally, to wrap up there now. Uh, so overall, from our point of view, we felt that it was quite successful. Our clients uh, reported that they were very uh, they found a very positive, overwhelmingly positive valuation by clients and the MDT team. And it was nice, the clients commented on the sense of togetherness they felt with the MCST group because they were cocooning, they didn't see us, they didn't see any of the rest of the group, but they still felt that togetherness, which I think is, is really important. And it raises some interesting uh, prospects for CST and MCST, um, that if you have clients maybe through illness during the normal course of a, of a, of a program, uh, you know, might miss, miss sessions through illness uh, or other or bereavements, perhaps, that you could adapt uh, miss sessions to a phone call for, you know, uh, to provide that continuity if people are missing a couple of weeks at a time. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your time and attention. Uh, so again, this is the, the reference for the short publication we have uh, on this adaptation. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to present today. So next we'll hand over to Sinead Grennan and Carly Duggan, who will present on the Irish Dementia Cafe Network. Thank you, Sinead and Carly. Okay, Grace, uh, thank you so much, um, Carol. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about the network and then I'll hand over to Carly. So I just have a short PowerPoint here. So I'm together with Grace Dennison, the Irish Dementia Cafe Network Coordinator. This is a project, there we go, the, a project that was commissioned by the National Dementia Office in July 2019, and Ina Begley has commented on that earlier on, funded by Public Dormant Accounts through the Department of Health. And it was based on um, the provisional findings of research that was carried out by the Centre for Economic Social Research in Dementia on Dementia. It's now published uh, by Tiha Nadal, Family Carers Perspective on the Alzheimer Cafe. How does for the slide, that these slides are moving on of their own volition. So the findings of that research were that cafes were located sporadically around the country. There were about 20 cafes. There was a lack of cohesion. There was variable quality, variable attendance. Um, however, there was clear evidence of benefits people living with dementia and their carers. And the research also showed some proposed, it proposed some central pillars to the Dementia Cafe. So the project objectives, supporting the rollout of a flexible Alzheimer Cafe model across Ireland, the establishment of new Alzheimer Cafes by engaging with communities of interest, particularly Understand Together, and that's already been commented on earlier on, provide support and guidance to the existing Alzheimer cafes, 
develop an Alzheimer Cafe network, and then raise awareness and understanding of the Alzheimer Cafe model. So we had a three phase plan. I'm not going to read out all of this, but you can see phase one was August to January, pre really all about engagement with um, an expert advisory panel, with the cafe coordinators, holding meetings together, really starting to discuss the cafe model. Phase two then, there was supposed to be, a, there was to be a cafe learning networking day in February, which had to be delayed because of COVID. And then looking at branding, promotion of cafes, and now we're in phase three. So the cafe has been launched and we're working on a toolkit and how-to workshops. So I'll come to that in a moment. Key project activities where well, we established an expert advisory panel. Uh, we engaged regularly with all cafe coordinators. Together, we collaboratively developed a principle-based framework for the Dementia Cafe. And this was really, really good and really interesting. Um, it kind of allows for flexibility. A lot of the cafes and the Alzheimer Cafe is built on a Dutch model that's really quite strict and rigid. And what the um, Anya Tihan and Eamon O'Shea found from their research was that cafes around Ireland variously had different types of, um, they were run in different ways and really there needed to be flexibility to allow for difference, but also there needed to be um, principles that would be shared so that there would be more cohesion. Also, we collaboratively developed, discussed what would be the key activities of an Irish Dementia Cafe network. We also decided on a shared name, Dementia Cafe, rather than Alzheimer cafes. So around the country, there were dementia cafes, Alzheimer cafes, memory cafes. The minister commented there on the Daisha cafe down in Waterford. So there were all different types of cafes, but all sharing similarities and similar principles. We set up a virtual cafe in response to the COVID crisis in March. And then we also mentored other cafes in the virtual cafe engaged with communities of interest, like I said, raised awareness of the cafe service, launched it in September and then established a digital presence. So here are the four pillars of the Dementia Cafe, atmosphere, information, support and community. And you can see from the other speakers there how it really is part in terms of the post-diagnostic pathway, it really is touching a lot of the bases and helping to be a part of joining the dots and reducing fragmentation of services. So it's a welcoming once monthly meeting for people who are affected by dementia. So it's people living with dementia, their families, their friends, healthcare professionals, and then people in the local community who are interested in supporting a dementia inclusive community. So everybody is welcome to attend. Cafe is run by local voluntary steering committees and they are always free of charge. So here are just some images from um, social media, our virtual dementia cafe. So we set it up weekly, Friday morning, 11 a.m. in April. Um, it was adapted. So it was the dementia cafe model, but just adapted a little. So there was still a theme every week, very much focused on, you know, the atmosphere. Um, so bringing the cafe into people's kitchens. So I think there was a phenomenally positive response to it and a real sense of togetherness and people kind of got it I mean social supports unfortunately with COVID um, had to be uh, suspended cafes just like other social supports but people really did embrace this notion of the cafe coming into their home even though they couldn't go out to the cafe the virtual cafe running it weekly also gave us an opportunity to mentor other cafe groups so you can see there over on the left, that is Maeve Montgomery, um, one of the Alzheimer's Society's dementia advisors, and she is a coordinator of several cafes. So she spoke at our event a few times, and then she is also now running a virtual cafe. Here's, some, here's a photo um, from one of our virtual cafes. Um, yep. So you can see, I will go back to it, like you can see the energy and the joy and it really does capture that the cafe is all about atmosphere it's all about togetherness peer support uh, learning supporting each other we launched the cafe network in september minister mary butler thank you very much minister who launched it for us along with miriam o'callaghan who had launched ireland's very first 
Alzheimer Cafe in 2011 and we had set that up as a multi-stakeholder um, initiative which involved a lot of the same organizations actually that were then involved in the expert advisory panel for this project. So the DSIDC, the Alzheimer's Society, experts by experience. Um, Kevin and Talina Quaid, who are on the expert advisory panel and who also run uh, the Canterk Memory Cafe, they were on the panel, they're running a cafe and they also spoke at the launch uh, very kindly. You can see Anya Tihan there from uh, the Centre for Economic, Social Research and Dementia, who spoke about the project. Ema Begley, um, I spoke too. And then there's Grace Dennison, the other coordinator. This is our website. We launched a website, dementiacafe.ie. So you can see, you can see there some a photo kind of capturing what it's about. And here is our cafe finder on the website, find your local member cafe. So here are the member cafes around the country. So you can see Cavan, Monaghan, Louth, Meath. Now, as, as you'll see them popping up, you will also notice the black spots. And that's the next focus of um, this phase of our project, really looking at those parts of Ireland where there are no cafes and how we can support them to start up cafes. So the next steps, a uh, virtual learning networking day, reaching out to support communities of interest, a cafe toolkit, development of resources, and then we'll be holding those two um, information workshops. So that is the Dementia Cafe. I will now hand over to Carly. Hi, thanks very much for the invite. Well, I'm one of the people that really hugely benefited from attending the cafe in Donnybrook. Um, when I found it, I literally went went and attended it every single month. I was really quite addicted to going because I had so little support in my own life. I was really, really relieved when I came across the cafe. And when Owen got the diagnosis of dementia, when he was told finally in, in the second opinion, I brought him along. And it was one of the really safe places for Owen to come to. We didn't have much support outside of that cafe. You know, it was a very, very difficult time for the two of us because he was young, you see. Owen was in his 50s, in his mid 50s when he got the diagnosis. And it was a really frightening and a very, very lonely place for him to be. So when we arrived at the cafe, he was completely relaxed. He enjoyed himself. He loved going every month with me and he engaged with people. And I don't mind admitting it, but we had, I suppose, the rowdiest table in the cafe. We were always making noise. We were always laughing. We had a great crack. And it was one of the few places I found that people didn't ignore Owen. In general in life, people would talk to me, even if Owen was beside me. They might ask me something about Owen and I would say, well, look, Owen is there, it's fine. You know, talk to him yourself. But in the Alzheimer Cafe in Donnybrook, people looked at Owen, they chatted to him, they talked to him, they called him by his name. So he was never ignored like he was on the outside. And he actually made new friends because as I said earlier, having Alzheimer's when you're very young, well, I think it's a very lonely place for anybody, but I think when you're a younger man, it's a much lonelier place to be. And this was one place I found that Owen actually developed friends and, you know, you, we did develop good friends and we have found good friends from the Alzheimer Cafe in Donnybrook. And this idea of physically going to a place where there was physically warmth, there was friendship, there was hugs, there was kisses, and then there was the tea, the coffee, just the whole social ambience of the place. And that is actually very, very huge to somebody that is, if you like, more ignored on the outside. And it's a, in, in the world of dementia, and when you have dementia, you tend to lose friends or some of your friends on the outside. But in this place, he didn't, he gained friends. And it was just some place where we felt very safe and very secure and where we were welcomed. And Owen was accepted for what he was. And I was accepted as a carer. So we literally looked forward to this every single month. It was on my calendar. We never missed a month session. We went, we enjoyed it. We were the first to come to the cafe. I think we were probably one of the last to leave as well every evening. And it was just somewhere we could go together collectively and it was okay to have dementia. It was okay to have had that diagnosis because people in the cafe understood. And the other thing I really liked about it as well is that I found I learned a huge amount from listening to the talks because there was a talk every month 
in some aspect of dementia. And I got a huge amount of information and support just by learning where I could go and what I could do in relation to dealing with this. Because for me, you see, it was a huge crisis, not just because Owen was young, but just after we got married, he had a heart attack. So we had a whole plethora of different medical problems over all those years. So by the time I got the diagnosis of dementia for Owen, I was on my knees and I was, I thought I was demented myself at the time I was in such a, I was in such a state. It nearly broke the two of us because it was just like the last straw of many years of a nightmare. But I have to say for me on a personal level, <clears throat> pardon me, attending the cafe was for me a lifesaver on a personal level. It was a complete lifesaver. And it was the really first, I suppose, area of support that the two of us got. Now I did obviously attend a, a monthly support group myself for carers, but obviously I couldn't bring on to that. So the cafe to me was a lifesaver. <clears throat> now that might actually sound like an exaggeration, but in, in actual fact, it isn't. I was hanging off a cliff at that point in time. And this was somewhere I could go where I could literally sit down and relax and have a chat. We had a laugh and Owen was completely himself there. And he would physically help then when the cafe was over at the end of the evening, he would get up, you know, and he's quite a, a shy man. He's, quite introverted in some ways but he would get up and he'd go around the tables and he'd collect the, the cups and saucers he'd bring them over to the sink and he was he was helping and he got a really buzz out of that and I was delighted and amazed when I used to watch him doing that because I knew he felt safe and I mean we came from, from an environment and a house where we really weren't safe and it wasn't really a very secure place where we were living at the time so this cafe was just a lifesaver it really was and I would recommend it to anybody anywhere in Ireland, if you, you know, if you have or are dealing with any kind of a relationship with dementia, definitely, you know, it's some, some type of support that you can look at and engage with. I think you genuinely would benefit from it. Okay, that's, that's great. Thank you so much, Carly, for sharing your um, personal experience there. And, you know, you can really uh, sense from you the importance that the, the cafe played in, in yourself and Owen's lives. So thanks so much for sharing that and thanks Sinead as well for introducing us to the uh, the cafe network. Um, so and Carly will be joining us on the panel discussion. I know we're um, very uh, late on time unfortunately it's just the addition of a few extra minutes on it from everybody's talk so hopefully everyone's able to stay with us. So uh, we'll crack on. Um, so our final speaker then before the panel discussion is Samantha Taylor who's head of the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland's Dementia Advisory Service. And Samantha will talk about this service. Hello everyone, and um, I'm delighted to be with you uh, today and to uh, uh, be part of this forum. And um, as Carla said, I've just asked to give an overview of, of our uh, Dementia Advisory Service and as other speakers have, speakers have said, uh, we're in a happy position where we can now make this a, na a, a real national service um, and that's been the result of, of many years of, of hard work by a large number of people. Um, I suppose I just wanted to reflect, you know, in 2013 we started with a pilot with two people in, based in Dublin and Cork, two of our most experienced staff, um, and we did that because there was a such a consistent expression of need from people with dementia and their families to have that dedicated point of uh, of information provision and signposting that was accurate, accessible, accessible and timely. Um, and we were very fortunately uh, um, able to kind of grow that team from two to eight. And uh, since 2015, we've, we've had a team of eight uh, staff working across the country. And um, as the National Dementia Office came on board, the HSC and the National, Office, National Dementia Office have helped us um, and financially supported us to deliver that uh, and indeed work towards expansion of the service. Um, so I suppose at its core, when it, it, it began, and we were very fortunate, there was, there was models in the UK and, and in Scotland particularly um, of similar services, and we drew heavily on those and we drew on our experiences coming through from our national helpline and our, the ASI services, social clubs, cafes, home care, daycare, respite services, to kind of understand what people were looking for. And we, we built the service around information and advice um, and, and a pathway to support people to access services and supports and, and a kind of a crisis prevention. So we, we knew the earlier we could get to people, the earlier we could provide the service, 
um, the more beneficial it was. Um, and what we've, I suppose, come to understand through running the service over these last seven years is that reducing social isolation and stigma, enabling participation and engagement, maintaining independence and well-being, and, and really supporting um, the connection, peer-to-peer -peer support have been absolute key outcomes and kind of pivotal parts of this role. Um, and I suppose when when somebody accesses the service and it can be a, a person with dementia or a family carer, um, we go through, uh, we, we meet and we go through um, specific things that we know um, people need information about. So we will talk to people about, you know, very practical elements, elements like driving or um, after a diagnosis is confirmed or, you know, thinking about starting to plan legal and financially. Um, but actually, relationships and uh and staying active and and doing what what is important to you and what you feel makes you you are also key parts of that service uh of this service um and relationships in terms of not only talking to families um and friends about the diagnosis but also meeting new people and 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 uh, i think previous speakers have really reflected on that and and uh i think this service has 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 definitely worked towards enabling that for people with dementia and their families and it is very much we work with both and sometimes the person with dementia we're working with them completely on their own and families dip in and out sometimes we're working with a family member and the person with dementia may, may participate in some meetings and may not in others so it's it's a real depending on 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 who we're with and we were very focused early on that we would um, we wanted to understand what the impact of the service is and in 2017 we did our own internal uh, client impact survey to, to try and understand how people were, what difference this service made and then we were really delighted when the HSE and the National Dementia Office uh, commissioned an external piece of, of research, um, Emer mentioned it earlier, led by Alice Coffey and that really gave us tremendous insights into the service. It, it not only spoke to people with dementia and their families who, who were using the service, but it also spoke to health and social care professionals. And it gave us really good insights uh, to what the service meant to them. And again, I suppose, the individualized person centered part of the service is hugely important and having that one place to go that dedicated place to go but also what came has come out is is the more community piece so the you know being out and about on our mobile information center doing talks and men's sheds and in libraries and uh, active retirement and people seeing that there was support there and people understanding that actually they weren't alone and actually understanding that it was okay to talk about it um, and I think our health and social the feedback from the whole health and social care professionals uh, was also really an endorsement of the service. Um, the evaluation in 2018 spoke to, to health and social care professionals who, who worked with dementia advisors across the 11 counties and also those who didn't. And that gave us really good insights around the gap, you know. Um, and uh, again, the, many of the teams we work with uh, have really reflected very strongly how the DA service you know, was, a, was a, a really good add on to what they're doing and, and enhanced the service that they provided. Uh, and we were working very hard to integrate across a number of diagnostic teams, but also community based teams, uh, public health nurses, community, uh, community hubs, uh, social care workers, um, occupational therapists. We've, we've worked very well with the memory technology libraries as, as they've grown and developed and they're a really great addition. Um, so I suppose I did want to also mention that, you know, throughout COVID-19, we have operated. Uh, we've had to, like everybody else, adapt and change what we're doing. The team has has uh, been extremely busy over this time. And ASI did some research on uh, caring and coping uh, with dementia during uh, COVID-19. And, 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 you know, it very, very much the, the Dementia Advisor Service fed into that. Um, and I think the team have, you know, had to dig deep at times over the past eight, eight months, like every other um, team, 
Um, and we've worked really hard to make sure that while we're not meeting people in their homes, we are continually to meet them. Um, I suppose we've had a 48% increase in the number of meetings that the team have had, and we've had well over a thousand new clients, despite the fact that, you know, diagnostic service had to close for a period of time this year. Um, and we've really, you know, our, our website, we've added on new sections, we've developed new re resources, and uh, some in partnership with the DSIDC, others, um, you know, working with other teams to just really try and be there as much as possible. Uh, we've done four webinars across the country on items like uh, mental health and well-being, carers resilience, but also um, art appreciation and eating well uh, and nutrition um, during these times. So. Uh, lots of lots of impact uh, in terms of, but we've we've managed to keep the service going throughout, working very closely with our with our national helpline. And I know people, uh, both Minister Butler and Emer have have referenced the expansion of the team, and where it's a wonderful situation for us to be in. That our eight, and the, here's the the map that Emer referenced earlier. The all those blue counties, uh, you know, we're actively recruiting now to be able to provide. Um, uh, turn those counties green and, and put at least a part time service in those counties now. And as Minister Butler said earlier, the budget 2021 means that a further 11 posts will allow to us where we have a part time service to make it a full time service and where we have counties that have quite high density populations will be able to add. Um, and we're really excited about that and we're working closely with the National Dementia Office to ensure that, that these teams are integrated very well um, and, and linked with existing supports and services uh, in those counties um, so that we can work in a really connected way and, and work together. And that's, that's it from me. I look forward to the panel discussion. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Samantha. That was a um, very interesting presentation there. Um, so we're going to um, start the panel discussion. So we're obviously way over time and apologies um, to all our attendees. Uh, hopefully you can stay with us. We'll, um, if you can, we'll run until four to give us the full half hour. So hopefully all our, our panelists are able to stay with us. Um, I'm just going to introduce you, you've met, um, You've met Sinead and you've met Carly Duggan and you've met Samantha Taylor and Emer Begley. So our two extra panelists are Professor Sean Kennelly, a consultant geriatrician and clinical director of the Memory um, and Assessment Service at Tallaght University Hospital, and Susan Scally, principal officer in the social care division at the Department of Health. So thanks for joining us today. Um, and so some of our other speakers are, are, are uh, tuning in as well. So if uh, they want to contribute, um, they can do so. And so Matthew Gibb is going to be the moderator for this session. And um, Matthew is the director of the DSIDC in St. James's Hospital. So I'll hand over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Carol. And um, thank you for putting together this, uh, this very, very interesting forum. It's been great hearing what everybody's been up to. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not going to waste any time because we're, 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 uh, we are well behind schedule. So uh, I'm, I'm going to plow on with the first question. Now, I thought I might, uh, I'm going to open up these questions to the full panel, but just to get things rolling, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Sean Kennelly there um, uh, just about, uh, just perhaps in, 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 his, um, in his opinion, uh, if you might tell us um, uh, what he thinks is an appropriate care pathway for, for people diagnosed with dementia and, and how that's been affected by the, uh, by the outbreak of COVID-19. Thanks, Matthew, and uh, thanks to all the speakers. It was a great range of talks, and, and I suppose in particular, thank you, Carly, for sharing your experience. And I was particularly struck by your phrase when you said that you were hanging off a cliff and you know the importance of those interventions around support to you. And it does also highlight that as, as reassuring and as positive it is, as it is to hear about all the endeavors that we have underway, we are also, and as a service and myself included in, in how we do it, there is a failure here to support people when they get to that sense that they, they have very few places to turn to. And I think that's the essence of what the post-diagnostic systems are, the yeah, services are and how important they are because people are left with that sense. And that's you know what you expressed resonated with me because it's something that's expressed in clinic quite often. So, so thank you for that. I think with regards to post-diagnostics, um, it, it really comes down to, you know, it starts at disclosure and it starts with, you know, proper disclosure and access to disclosure. Minister Butler mentioned that. And actually, you know, the, the fact that people should get 
a, an appropriate and positive and hopeful disclosure with regards to what it is is going you know is, is is going to happen. Give them a reassurance with regards to the accuracy of the diagnosis. So access to an accurate diagnosis is really important for setting the ball uh, you know in motion for then participation in those post-diagnostic pieces. It's very hard to recover. I often use the analogy of, you know, ship goes in the wrong direction. It's very hard to correct it afterwards if somebody hasn't had an accurate disclosure. And with, with the best post-diagnostic services, you know, possible, if somebody hasn't had a positive and accurate disclosure, that, that, can send things, that can send things going astray. I think also, I mean, it's this, for, for many decades, I think we had these kind of silos of the social care model and the biological or slash medical care model. And I think what's been really important over the last decade, um, and particularly in the last five years, is we stepped aside from that, okay? So I, as a clinician, have a responsibility to start somebody into their post-diagnostic pathway. So it's not enough for me to be doing a memory clinic I have to be delivering a memory service and that I have to be part of that ecosystem of support then. So when somebody goes to a cafe and, they, uh, and an issue is, uh, you know, is, is highlighted or a question is prompted, that I'm able to see them in a seamless fashion again. Or that when somebody, as frequently happens, so we have uh, the dementia advisors sit in our clinic once a month, the two dementia advisors from, from, from our service, so that there is this connection between these post-diagnostic services and that diagnostic piece. And that is, if you like, that ecosystem of support that we need to kind of get more equitable access to across the country and, and kind of break down that separation between this, what's what was traditionally called biological model versus social care model. It needs to be one model and it needs to be one pathway. And there shouldn't be a detachment, a detachment across services. And then the other point is, is, is also where we diagnose and how we diagnose dementia is changing. So our whole focus is about getting a timely diagnosis at much earlier stages when part of the post-diagnostic pathway has to be brain health and has to be about how we get people into, you know, and we find that as a really important um, element of the diagnosis or disclosure around hope is that you're giving people things that they can do and our exercise programs which both the supporter and the the person who's living with dementia can participate in and those kind of things where they can you know similar to the cafes you know they can participate in them together uh, and there's kind of a positive focus around them and a sense of you know proactivity and we're doing something and we're working together and I think that's a really important uh, piece at that that early stage and then I think the next thing is capacity and making sure we build capacity across the system to deliver you know these services because at the moment even with the very welcome investment we're still falling well short of the, the you know the necessary you know case management and support that's that needs to be there for people with dementia to 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 kind of you know you know do this in a holistic fashion in an integrated in, in an integrated fashion so I think we need to be really scaling up capacity yeah I just ask John. I, I'm, I mean, I'm very aware and, and impressed by the, the range of services you've managed to leverage um, through through the community there. Um, I, I'm just wondering how, how badly is the has COVID-19 impact on your services? Just briefly. So I think in the first wave, um, you know, significant impact because I suppose the disclosure piece and the clinic piece. Now, what we did is we tried, we went straight to telephones and everybody in the service on the database got a phone call. And, you know, anybody who, who identified as, as they, that they were struggling, then they got they, they, they got follow up calls and they were kind of brought into it. And there would be a close relationship with the nurse practitioners here in, in the clinic. I think the big impact from COVID has been the diminished access to day centers, which was mentioned, uh, you know, so the lack of access to day centers of access to respite that has been a massive impact with the guards how we support people living in the community uh, and you know as, as much as i understand the challenges in getting those services and i would be sympathetic and you know i've worked you know in and you know i would see people both in clinic at home in their homes and in nursing homes so i've seen that range of impact of covid so i don't underestimate it but we have managed to get every, a lot of other things open and we have managed to resurrect an awful lot of services and yet these pieces haven't been, you know, resurrected quite to the same level that I, you know, that you would hope to to get them back up to. But there's no question. I think the day centres and the respite access has been has been the biggest impact that, that I certainly would see as a clinician. Thanks, Sean. Um, Carly, I was just interesting, you know, interested from from a, a, a very personal point of view. Um, uh, your perspective. I mean, you're, you're obviously. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how you know COVID has, has impacted on, on on your ongoing care for your, for for Owen. Well, to tell you the truth, Matthew. Obviously, I can't get into Owen now. I did have a couple of visits to the glass in the early stages, but that's not possible at the minute. And you know, like 
he's kind of ill at the minute in that he's got an awful boil, but I can't get into him. And I really find that frustrating. So when they do a, a video call, you know, to the WhatsApp or whatever it is, I do my whistles with him because, you know, he was into birds and all that. And he tries to whistle back. He tries to put his lips together. But I am finding it really, really hard because I would go into him all every day, sometimes two or three times a day at weekends and that. And he was used to having me going in and playing with him and black garden with him, all the things that I used to do in the cafe. And now that's all gone. So he doesn't have me going in, you know, messing with him, black garden with him, tormenting him, you know, and getting him to do all kinds of mad stuff, you know, like we always did. And I find that awful. So when I see him on the WhatsApp or whatever, or whatever you call that system they have, I find it awful. Because I know he can't really see me because his eyes are closed most most of the time. You know, he can hear my voice and he knows my daft whistles because I don't ever get it right. He was always telling me that. But I do find it awful to be absolutely honest with you. And I really, what I want to do is I actually want to break into the nursing home. <laughs> I know I get arrested and all that and I don't want the hassle, but I just feel I should be getting in there, even if it's breaking all the rules. And I know I can't. So because I see him going down and he's so young and... You know, it's such a lonely experience for him. And I just, there's nothing I can do. Do you know what I mean? And I have that level of frustration. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't know what to do. It's very, very hard. I, I feel for you, you know, Carly. Um, Ema, um, I was just wondering, like, I mean, we've been working on this, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the overall model. And I was just wondering, um, again, just from, from, I mean, you're seeing things from a slightly different perspective. You know, we're, we're very, very much immersed in the in, in the in the kind of the, the health system, if you like. And I'm just wondering, from from your perspective, you know, from looking outside the box slightly, um, what you feel would be the main elements of that care pathway, or, or the, I mean, I know primarily we're talking about um, post-diagnostic supports here. I think one of the things that struck me, and it's it's something that Carly said as well, and Sean touched on, it's this trying to avoid crisis. You know, where people come and look for a service when they're in crisis. And it's really about more proactive type care. So the person gets on the care pathway early, very, you know, the diagnosis leads into continuity of care in the care pathway, and it's a seamless transition. And there is some type of, um, there's a single point of contact for that person if an issue emerges, but also that there is a, a holistic needs assessment for the person and the services wrap around them, where that needs assessment can be updated over time as, as needs change. At the moment, I think, well, it's changing slightly, but at the moment, people are really hitting crisis before they get any type of intervention. And it's really about trying to avoid that. You know, the aims of the National Dementia Strategy are to support people to live well at home for as long as possible. And we have to have that if that's something that's going to be achieved. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, that's, I think that's something that all practitioners uh, are, are witnessing, you know. Um, and I'm just conscious of time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna bump along to the next question. Um, and uh, Susan, just to give you fair fair warning, I'm gonna I'm gonna pop at you first, okay? <laughs> um, so just uh, I suppose look into the future, and, and and hopefully this is a future where um, you know kind of COVID nineteen is 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 well in the rearview mirror. Um, so uh, how how do we achieve these aims? How do, how do we get this this care pathway in in, in place? And 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 what what again what what would the the main elements from from the Department of Health's perspective be? I suppose, um, I mean, the first thing really is that um, Sláinte Care really sets out um, the approach in terms of, you know, getting the right intervention, getting it at the right time and getting it in the right place. And everything that previous speakers have spoken about in terms of access to the care pathway, and getting access to the intervention or the whether it's getting access to a timely diagnosis and then getting access to services and supports and then getting um, a continuum of care that sort of um, provides the appropriate supports at different stages of the, the journey really right up to end of life. So um, in terms of the department's perspective, it is about um, implementing the national dementia strategy, and I think everything, everything in relation to um, the, the practices and the policies, it's all there within the strategy. It's a very good strategy, um, but we have struggled really to resource it. 
Um, and uh, we, the National Dementia Office, have been excellent in terms of um, piloting, testing concept, getting getting things underway. And I think this year's budget was the first real time that I saw we actually are getting some substantial investment to actually make some of these important initiatives happen. And I think from the department's point of view, how we care for older people has to um, has to change in terms of COVID-19 has taught us some lessons around the risks of having a model of care for older people that's overly focused on residential care. So then you're back again to um, making sure that the services are delivered and accessible as close to home as possible. And so um, the range that like this, the range of initiatives that we hope um, will um, be supported through budget 21 funding and into 2022 are all dealing with different aspects of that. So the Dementia Advisor Service expanding that. And um, because again, what we learned from um, COVID-19 um, when the Dementia Advisor Service wasn't sort of doing its normal service, it started to pick up people who it wasn't aware of. And then um, getting more, more um, access to memory assessment services and getting, uh, you know, apart from St. James, is getting a new service uh, in, in Cork. So really, really kind of making the model of care happen um, and um, then trying to ensure that people don't end up having and the crisis point that Emer made is very important that often it's in a crisis that people maybe end up prematurely in residential care and if they've got the services at home maybe they would have been with support able to remain at home so not so so so, so it's it is an, integ an integration between we have a dementia strategy, we have a carer strategy, so supporting the carer and trying to support the person to access services at home. And then the point around then, um, if you can't provide the service, um, you know, can't provide daycare services in the same way that you give that access at home. But I absolutely agree with Professor Canelli that, um, you know, really need to get Day services back up and running um, for people with dementia. So I hope that has answered your question somewhat. Yeah, I think uh, I think we all welcome uh, you know the increased commitment in this year's budget. I, th I think um, I don't think anybody's going to knock that by any by any stretch. Um, I think the essence here is is about widening that, that the, the choice that people have right across the spectrum. Uh, and uh, I think that obviously I think I, I personally agree with you in, in relation to residential care. I think that's a, that's a, that's a major issue. Um, Samantha, um, just to, to, to jog along to you now, um, what, uh, what, what do you think uh, would be the, the primary um, or the most important parts of a, a post-diagnostic support pathway? Um, for me, it's it's the, it's the integration piece that uh, Professor Canelli mentioned earlier, and and where we have managed to do that, uh, and we're very integrated with Sean's team. Actually, um, it has really borne fruit for everybody, um, and actually, even during COVID, I think um, it really came into its own because not only was Sean's team on the phone, our team was on the phone, and actually, we were able to talk to each other, and where people were struggling, we were able to kind of. Uh, troubleshoot and, and navigate a new way of doing things because everybody was trying to figure out a new way of things because those seeds were there and because that integrated piece was there uh, and our, our teams were able to work with his team so well I, I think that's that's the most essential piece um, and and what it allows for is where where the diagnostic is happening and the disclosure is happening the follow-up then with with different services ours being one of them but it's only one of them there, there has to be that range and that toolkit um, that then has to be available to people as they go along and I suppose what I would say for me is I think we've all had that moment where we've had someone sit in front of us and go if only somebody had told me this six months ago or a year ago or worse five years ago we've all been there and really what we want to do is make sure people have an awareness of where they can go and that it's integrated as they go along it because that's what stops that. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a really it's a really good point. Uh, it's uh, it, it's a it's a great way of uh, the, the integration piece there you're talking about is with the the, uh, the dementia advisors who sit in once a month uh, uh, with, yeah. with John 
and the, 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 the memory assessment service there in Tala and, uh, and yeah. the kind of transfer information backwards and forwards is a bit, you know, cross referral. Uh, yeah, it seems to work quite effectively, doesn't it? And, and in fairness, um, working with the National Dementia Office now and expanding the team, you know, they, they're really committed to helping us um, replicate that, you know, uh, across the new areas that we're working in and building it in areas that we're already because we know it works, you know, um, and, and I think it's wonderful that we have been resourced to do that. Um, but it's, it's part of the jigsaw. Um, and there's other services that are needed as well, as, as you've mentioned. Um, and I suppose I think uh, post COVID, you know, there's been a huge amount of innovation actually during this pandemic. People have really stopped and thought, well, how how can we do things differently? And I think we can we can harness that as we go forward and think about do how we do it. So as important as daycare is, and we and we all want to see daycare back open, and we're working very hard to do that. You know, models like the daycare at home model are, are supporting that process. And you know, there's some learning for us as we evaluate that more and understand that more maybe we have hybrids and mix of different things going forward and we're not over reliant on one thing that could be vulnerable to a certain um outbreak of whatever you know so you know i i think we we we've, we're in a good place to build um at this point uh you know and the budget 2021 has definitely given us that space but there's for sure more to, more road to go yeah yeah so just to dig down a bit there your daycare at home um initiative how, 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 what does that look like on the ground uh, well, that, I mean, at this point, we're, we're, uh, we've rolled it out. I think we've, we're delivering over a thousand hours at this point. Um, so what that does is for people who were accessing our day centres, uh, we're, we're able to provide a two hour block of activity. That's, um, we've, we've done an assessment to understand what the person's needs are. And that's led by our, our, our day centre nurse manager, that assessment. Um, and then based on that assessment, where a, a care worker will, will go to the home for a two hour block. And the focus is on activity and engagement and what might be needed uh, for that person, what they want, but also for their family member to have some respite because what we've really heard during um when everything was you know the first wave if you want families really were are struggling and they have had, they've had a really really challenging and despite all our phone calls and all our best efforts there was a lot of isolation and loneliness and i suppose this is in the absence of a full day day center and in the absence of respite this is a, a block of time that allows the person to meet other another person and, and be engaged and stimulated, but also the family member to to do something else, which they need they really, really need to do. Um, so we're, we're rolling that out and, and we've been really supported by the HSC on that to do that. Um, but we're simultaneously working on what day centres can we get open? How can we get them open? And we're working. We're trying to work really hard to deliver that because we know that's important, too. Yeah. Well, look, I think uh, hats off to to yourselves and to the HSC for for you know thinking outside the box and, and, and actually delivering services that are effective, uh, you know, in, immediately in people's homes, which is fantastic. Um, I'm I'm just going to open this up to the panel, so you know, feel free to kind of step in. Um, so what 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 can we? As, and we're not all practitioners, but um, just uh, as as members of the panel, perhaps, what what can we do to increase the the implementation and and the uptake of of, of these post diagnostic support programs? Um, from a personal point of view, I mean, I've been um, heavily involved in the in the Alzheimer Cafe in Donnybrook, and um, you know, uh, it's been running now for a good number of years, and uh, you know, we, we over that time we've seen kind of uh, you know our, our 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 numbers kind of you know wiggling around a bit and. Uh, Sometimes it can be very, very hard to, to, to recruit people, if you like, or to, to, to encourage people to attend. And there's such valuable forums. Now, I was just wondering what, uh, um, I mean, other people are, are bound to have difficulties like that in certain areas. I was just wondering, you know, what, what, what do we do? What can we do to try and encourage people to, 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 um, to take up these uh, um, and implement these, not only people who are using the services, but also the professionals who are running them? You know, how do we encourage people to, to take up the cudgel, if you like? Hi, hi, Matthew. As an, a non-practitioner and coming looking from the outside, one of the things that strikes me is that practitioners are practitioners. They're all about doing. And a lot of this um, is raising awareness that a service exists and establishing those referral pathways. And I don't think we give enough time 
in when we're setting up a service to, to think about that and actually the resource that's required for it. And I've seen it with the memory technology resource rooms, how so much time is going into, and some of those services are, some of the MTRs are relatively new. So much time is required to let people know that the service exists and for people to understand what the service does. And I don't think there's a full um, consideration of that in terms of the resource requirement. And it is establishing those referral pathways. And we saw it with the PDS grant scheme as well, how so much concerted time was just spent letting people know there was cognitive rehab available and letting people know what that meant, what, what it means and who's the audience for it as well. So I think certainly for me, from the outside looking in, that's that's one thing anyway. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, uh, sorry, yeah, it, it, I think it's it's about, you know, where you locate those hubs, I mean, the, those information hubs, and I think that's kind of, you know, is, is where where is the resource that people, and that's why it's been so useful for us to have that partnership with, you know, with the Alzheimer's Society, because actually that is a, a, a very identifiable if you like, brand for people who are who are supporting care. So when people are thinking of look, looking for where they access information, then then that's that's an important repository. I think it's how you bring that down to the you distill it down to the the local level, to the local community level, and how we're able to do it at, at that that level. And I think that's why the the post diagnostic pathway has to start in around that disclosure centre. That information, that that first kind of signpost, or has to be there. And I think people need to know, and they need to have ways back into that person or onto the next sign poster. So be it you know, through the dementia advisor. So I think it is about starting there. People, people don't necessarily always want to, I mean, and, and you, know, you know, we all know here is depending on where people are at and their state of mind when they receive a diagnosis and where their supporters are when they receive a diagnosis, they may or may not want to participate in this. So actually there isn't really any means of cajoling or, you know, forcing people into it. People get to these things in their own time. And I think it is about how you create that soft interface that when people have come to terms with, now I would like to engage with this, is, is, is that, they're, that, that they're able to do it. It's a very difficult thing to manufacture. Uh, and I think that's that's what we're all finding is, is challenging. So I think having as many, having as much linkage between those partners who are going to, who are there to deliver it at a local level is, is that key piece. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think the Alzheimer's Society has certainly been that repository on a lot of a lot of occasions for us. Yeah, I'm pleased to mention Matthew. There's just two comments there from the audience there. So one person mentioned transport, so something very practical, which is transport, and somebody else said give information to the GP. So two good points there. Yeah, and I think uh, I think the that can, you know that, that that feedback of of information back to the GPs is very important. Um, I think also is the encouragement for the GPs to actually read that information when it comes as well. So um, there's a bit, of, bit of give and take there, I suppose. Um, um, sorry, just to mention one other comment coming in. Um, public health nurses are providing multiple service contacts continually to all elderly as they are needed and are well placed to do so. Um, so just another comment coming through there. Yeah. yeah and I, can I? Sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Go Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, yeah, we work with a lot of public health nurses. I would really echo that as well. They're, they're extremely important um, to us on the ground, not only our dementia advisor service, but actually all of our services. And we would we would work to link with them very strongly. And often, you know, there's a cross there's a cross sharing of information there because we can give a certain amount of expertise in some areas, but we actually need their input and vice versa. Um, but I would also just bring uh, the conversation back to awareness and that that local piece. Um, what we when we developed our mobile information service, which is our blue bus that goes around, you know, we got it into places like farmers markets, um, Saturday markets, the ploughing championships, anything like that. And what we found is actually that can just start a conversation. And, and actually, once you start the conversation, you can you can bring people along. But sometimes you've got to go to where they're at, what they're doing in their community. And, and for them to see, oh, look, there's something about Alzheimer's or dementia here, and that's in my space, and, and suddenly they're allowed to connect. And that's, I think, a huge piece in terms of how we, how we bring people into um, accessing supports and services in a timely way. Um, so I think the more that we can do of that, the better. Yeah, I think oh, something just to add here too, that is the role of the community important and all the work that I understand together have been doing to mobilize the community and certainly with the cafes the 
I mean, the model is plugging into the community and plugging into primary care, so bringing those together. But I do think stigma around dementia is still huge. Unfortunately, a lot of work mm -hmm. has been done. But I think in terms of access to services, it's kind of a multi-pronged approach, maybe. Um, like I know with the Alzheimer Cafe, Donnybrook, to come back to that, um, Matthew, a lot of people who lived like within a quarter of a mile had never heard of it. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that's one of the really good things, working with Eamon and Anya over in Galway, one of the really great things about having a network and having research and then building a network together is that really you can build more awareness and understanding. But the community is central to that. Absolutely. I thought it was, uh, you know, it's, it's, a kind of, it's kind of ironic in, in this, you know, in this age of the pandemic, you know, that, uh, you know, the, 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 the online, you know, the, the virtual uh, Dementia Cafe is, just, is so vibrant. It's fantastic, you know. Uh, I, I, it's been a real eye opener for me. I've, I've, I've been hugely impressed by, you know, by the, the virtual dementia cafes. It's been they're fantastic. Cafes, plural. There are now lots of, <laughs> lots of cafe groups. Sorry. Seriously, lots of cafe groups are going virtual. Oh, no, no, I, I, I did say cafes. It's, sorry, it's just it's maybe the audio. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, another comment coming in there, Matthew. Um, opening day centres safely is crucial for our members living with dementia. The feedback from our Yarn Social Club members and their family carers is that the disease has progressed in the absence of interaction, connection, and participation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's been a problem. Um, I, I just want to just quite very quickly, and I know you're right up against the time. I just very quickly, um, because we haven't mentioned it, and I, I see one from um, from Joan Fitzpatrick there. Um, there's a definite, there's still a definite problem um, uh, for uh, post-diagnostic support and indeed disclosure um, for people uh, under the age of 65 with a dementia. Uh, I just wonder if if MB from the panel has a, wants to have a quick comment on that because I think it's uh, it would be a shame to ignore that. Yeah, I mean, so I suppose within our memory service, we're, we, we see people who over and under the age of 65, uh, and there's no doubt there is, you know. You know, there's there's a different um, approach, and there's a, some you know different supports that are necessary. By the same token, I think you know the things that should be constant are the culture and philosophy. You know, with regards how you try and deliver those supports. Um, I think the settings can be can be different, and there should there should be a reflection on people's wishes, regardless of whether you're over sixty five and you'd rather you know maybe be be with you know older people, or whether you're younger and you'd rather be you know be you know, with with younger people who are coming to terms with the with the diagnosis, um, but but I think there's no question that there needs to be special attention. There's very little resource, and and I think the other service, you know, from the point of view of you know what the Department of Health have invested in is the integrated care program for older persons, is a is a phenomenal resource for people over the age of 65, whereby you know and that's the main the main means by which I'm able to do the domiciliary visits and have the support system about seeing people with behavioural and psychological symptoms of distress in their own homes. We don't have the same supports for people under the age of 65, and and I think it's it is about you know so you have some and sometimes the, the people with the skill set to maybe address some of those issues in in younger people, but without actually the same resource to do it, and and I think it's it's you know it, it's meant you know ideally you would like that we would view dementia such as something like cancer, and you would have a resource to deal with the issue, and age would not be the factor, but with the, where where you know, dementia and, and trying to identify resources from d dementia are concerned is we have never adequately resourced younger people with dementia. It is the, you know, accessing long-term care is such a challenge, accessing suitable settings for long-term care is such a challenge, uh, and then accessing the right information, um, holistic support around occupational issues and, and other care issues is always such a challenge for, for younger, you know, for younger people living with dementia would, would be the, the experience. Uh, and the else in the panel, we've, we've probably got time for one more comment. I mean, just just to add, I mean, I was just what was in my mind was timeliness. And um, if we want to have uptake that people maybe get that timely diagnosis so that, you know, that they haven't deteriorated or, or, or their dementia hasn't progressed, actually, the earlier you can you can reach people. And I suppose that would equally apply then to people who are under you know, who are under 65 getting getting the diagnosis at the right time. So again, it's back to the philosophy of Slauncher Care around, you know, intervening at the right time and in the right place. Um, so. Yeah, <laughs> you're quite right. Time is always a problem. <laughs> um, I think we're, 
I think we're up against time now. So uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, the panel, uh, Samantha Taylor, Sean Kennelly, Susan Scally, uh, Dr. Ema Begley. Uh, have I missed anybody? I'm not sure. Have I missed anybody? Don't think so. So listen, thanks so much for your time. I'll hand you back to Carol. Okay, thanks very much, Matthew. And thanks for moderating today's panel and thanks to all our panelists and speakers today. And um, thanks also to Grace, who, who's been pulling the strings in the background and um, has made sure everything's run, run smoothly. Um, and thanks to Engaging Dementia for inviting us to, um, to do this wrap up event. Um, and so uh, in terms of there'll be a recording available of this uh, forum and we'll also be producing a report um, a report of proceedings so that'll be available afterwards as well um, and sorry we didn't get around to answering all your questions I know some interesting comments were coming through there but we can capture them anyway um, through the, the uh, zoom forum so thanks for all your comments and questions Carol, and thanks for tuning in today. One sec I, I forgot to thank Carly Duggan sorry Carly. Okay. Oh, You'll get back for that in a <laughs> okay, so take care, everybody. Have have a good rest of the day. Bye now.